There we go. Hey, what's happening, my man? How are you doing today, Bill, with two L's? Bill with two L's. Do you have two in your name as well? Well, no one's ever wrote my name with one L, so I could, I could definitely go without saying that it's with two L's. Bill, I know a person who has a spelling of a Bill with one L. I also know a person who has a spelling of Bill with three L's. So I am Bill, I am Bill with two L's and I am with Bike for Humanity and you are, yes, you are. Bill with What's in a Name. And I am Bill with What's in a Name. What's in a Name is very, very important because it's our brand, it's who we are, what we stand for, what we live for, but it's also who's got a game and who can play. And so we're here, we're ready to tip it off, let's get going. Well, let's ride, my friend. Let's ride. So how's your day been going so far? That's a beautiful shirt you have there. I've got my Bike for Humanity shirt on right there. Right we on. Super, we are super excited about the big event coming up on Saturday, July 25th. This is an ongoing was- program. It, it started, Bill, with just an idea. And this was right when the uh, pandemic, COVID-19, which is the single most daunting and challenging opponent that I have ever faced in my life, 67 years now. But we were sitting around virtually at the beginning and somebody said, we got to do something. We can't just sit here and wait. We can't just sit here and get hit. And so we decided to come up with Bike for Humanity, which is a grassroots campaign that involves people and delivers a message, a message of health, of hope, of community and service. And so we have partnered with a variety of different groups to help them. And I have way too much experience, Bill, of starting over in my life. And we're starting over now in here in the Walton family for the 21st time with all the catastrophic health injuries that I've had. But I am healthy as can be, and we are working feverishly. And this year's event, yes, this Bill. event is helping to support – Free Bikes for Kids, which is a national organization run by Brother Terry Esau, which is phenomenal. What they do is they go out and they get the used bikes and they bring them in, bikes that are not being utilized any longer. They bring them in and they rehab them all and they fix them all up and then they give them away to the children who need a bike. Beautiful. While I love my bike, not everybody has a bike. By the way, that's a beautiful backdrop you have there. Is that a big tiger? Uh, yes, it's, it's a uh, it's actually a painting from a Chinese artist named Zhang. Uh, it's an really? artist. An art, I don't know if it's, almost, it's supposed to be in America. Uh, a Chinese physical therapist was really surprised they had a Zhang one time. Well, so. we live in a global community here, and our program, Bike for Humanity, is global. The last time we did it, which was back on April twenty fifth, we had thirty different states represented. Thirty different states, excuse me, and five different countries and different continents. We had Australia, we had Asia, we had Europe, we had South America, and we had North America as well. And now the second beneficiary of this year, of this month's event, Bike for Humanity Mm -hmm. 2, is No Kid Hungry, which is an organization that provides food for hungry children. We are the richest country in the history of the world, the United States of America. I'm a proud American patriot, but it is unacceptable to me that there are millions, millions and millions of young children who are hungry all the time. Now, people need to eat. I tried not eating one time. I could never get comfortable with it. And so no kid hungry is that we provide the food and what's happening right now with COVID-19, with the school closures, with the community centers closure, we have a situation where the children are not able to access the food that we have. Our country, our world, we have enough food. It's the political will, it's the willingness to share our strength, our strength as communities. So we've got free bikes for kids. We've got No Kid Hungry. We've got the Rex Foundation, which is a 37-year foundation, which funds science, art, education, the rights of indigenous people so that they can ensure their survival, 
and all the different things that go on. And I've been a member of that organization for the, since the beginning, the Rex Foundation, absolutely fantastic. And then we rounded off this year, this month. I keep saying year. Will you please? Wow. It's been a wild year, Bill. No worries. Like, so we're in 2020. I'm Bill on planet Earth, and you're in front of the tiger. And so the fourth beneficiary of this month's Bike for Humanity is the Boys and Girls Club. Now, I grew up in the Boys and Girls Club. I got my start there. And the Boys and Girls Club Thanks. is an incredible organization that provides a safe place. It provides programs, education, food sense of community, all the things that we stand for at Bike for Humanity, all the things that our country should be standing for. And so what we're doing here is it's a virtual event. We follow all the rules here, Bike for Humanity, and this is our second one. And so what we do is on the 25th, we, it's a free event. We go out and we participate in a sport of our choice. We call it Bike for Humanity because that's what I can do. I can no longer yeah. play basketball, I can no longer walk, I can no longer run, but I can go in the pool and move around a little bit, stretch it out, try to evade the tiger there, and then go in the weight hey. room, pump it up, let's go, and then I can get out of my bike. And physical exercise is critical to maintain all aspects of our health. And so we are encouraging everybody in this, and physical exercise is one of the director's directives of the CDC. And so we right. are in total compliance with all things CDC, masks, social distancing, hygiene, washing everything, keeping everything super clean. Because the, the foundational strength of our team, of our community, of our country, of our world is the strength of the individuals. And we have to take care of ourselves. And then as we get going, and I'm doing fine, then we, we reach out to other people because the opportunity, the privilege of making other people's dreams come true, there's nothing like that in the world. Now tell me, Bill, what is this what's in a name deal you got going? So what's in a name actually started out in, when I was living, I've been, Bill, I've been, I'm coming from Boston today, but uh, I've been here. You're in Boston. I've, I've, I gotta be honest with you, I do have some UCLA bias. I worked at Pico and Westwood as a sales manager for two years, so nice. go Bruins. Uh, uh, Pico I, I, and Sepulveda. There's a great song out there called Pico and Sepulveda. Check that one out. But that's just <laughs> I gotta hear it. Oh yeah, that's it's... where a good bus stop is. But uh, yeah, so what's in the name started as a radio show, um, and then they asked. They said one day, "Hey, Bill, you need to have a name for your show." And I said, "Man, I'm not just gonna call it the Bill Lang Show." So I'm writing about 50, 60 names down the piece of paper. I gotta be on the air by two. It's 1.30, Rodney Dangerfield skit comes on the Pandora entitled, What's in a Name? I couldn't have laughed harder. And we're exploring everything. We're not just in one, diff one, one aspect. What's in a name, Bill? You know, like- we're gonna, Inspiration, we're gonna, we're gonna Rodney Dangerfield. What an awesome force of nature. Rodney, just the so- Positive so powerful, force of nature. So creative, so, so imaginative, so full of life, so full of hope and all the different great things that, that he did and all the other people who are working tirelessly to make a difference. And what brings you to Boston today, Bill? Well, I grew up here in the Boston area. I graduated from high school here. I went to UMass. And then after college, I moved out to Los Angeles. You know, nice. West L.A. fade away. And, uh, you know, I had to start off West L.A. I worked at Pico and Westwood. Then I moved to Robertson and Olympic and lived there for a bit. And then... Some family stuff happened, came back to Boston. So I've uh, just been here dealing with that since. So, Change, you know, opportunity, it, privilege, all the different things we're working for. And as we face this COVID-19 crisis, never forget the other crises that are going on simultaneously, which all roll never into built. one. The economic uh, challenge that we're all facing right now as everything has been disrupted. Now, usually we enjoy and like and ride the wave, the tsunami of disruption, but Disruption can go two ways, and it's how we channel it, how we force it. I'm on the positive side of disruption. I'm not into the negative aspects of that. Damn, so my brother. Then, then we have to learn how to make different, which is what we're in right now, make different better. And then we have to find a new path forward, and we have to do what's never been done before. No problem. Let's We've go. Never 
So that's right. I used, Bill. To, I used to live in Boston. It was fantastic. I, I, I Which area? In, I lived in Cambridge, right near Harvard Square. Uh, right on. Basically, up on Avon Hill Street, right above Radcliffe, and uh, all the different parks in, in beautiful Cambridge, and it was a fantastic experience for me. And I got to be on the Boston Celtics, which was my boyhood dream. And Bill, I have to ask you about it. I, I wanted to go in chronological order about your life, but however, playing how did how did coming for playing for the Celtics all come about? How are your initial conversations with Red? I called up Red. And I said, Red, I want to come and be a Boston Celtic. And I did not know this at the time, but when I got him on the phone, at the same time, he was having a face-to-face -face meeting in Red's office with Larry Bird about what to do for the next season, the upcoming season. And so Red, when he heard my request that I wanted to come and be on the Celtics, Red said, hmm, hold on a second. So... I heard this story from both of them later. Red puts his hand over the, the mouthpiece on the phone. There was no cell phones. There was no speaker phones in those days. This was 35 years ago. And so Red looks across his desk and there's Larry. And he said, Larry, you got Bill Walton on the phone here. He wants to come and be on the Celtics. What do you think? And Larry said, go get him, Red. And so Red comes right. back on the phone and he says, well, let's make this work. But the only thing I asked, Bill, is you don't say a word. Let me take care of everything. And so I held my tongue, which was very hard to do because I wanted to be a Celtic. But Red worked tirelessly. It took an inordinately a long time to get it done. Ultimately, I begged, I pleaded, and finally bought my way onto the Boston Celtics. And when I got there, it was so much better than I ever could have dreamed, so much better than I ever could have hoped. The Celtics, they didn't give me my career back they gave me my life back and it was so much fun I knew the basketball would be great because I you know I played against Chief a lot uh, in the early parts of our careers when he was with Golden State and I was with the Blazers yeah. and then I was yeah. hurt a lot and then Chief went on to Boston and championships and uh, Hall of Fame career NBA all-time team career and then they got the new guy they got yeah. Eric, Kevin and Danny and then they got DJ too and uh, you know, yeah. Red, Red was a master team builder. And it was, it, it was so phenomenal to be there on this, uh, on this organization, on this squad, on this team that was very similar to the way the UCLA Bruins were run when I went to college. And you know, with, with the outstanding leadership, the phenomenal coaching, the terrific players, the incredible fan base, just empty the thesaurus. There are so many descriptive words, all positive about what it was like. What I was unaware of was how great the life would be back in Cambridge in Boston. And how yes. much now, the weather, the weather was, was just terrible. I, I'm a San Diego Beach guy. And Great. This is my home. We still live here in San Diego, 41 years in the same home. But we came back to Boston there, and, and the Celtic fans, man, they treated me so great. It, it was just wonderful. We love and, you, Bill. And, and, and the players, the players were just incredible. And, and, and to spend every day with, with, with Larry Bird and Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish, Dennis Johnson, Danny Ainge, Jerry Seesting, Rick Carlisle, Scott Wedman, Greg Kite, David Thirdkill, Sam Vincent, Ray Melchiori, the trainer, the coaches, Casey Jones, uh, Chris, uh, Chris and, and – uh, I can't think of the other guy's name right now. It's because, cool, oh, Bill. Chris and Jimmy. The quarter. Chris and Jimmy. And then, and, and then I met Jimmy. so many really cool friends back there, still friends to this very day. And so I, I have a very close uh, uh, relationship with the uh, New England community there. And they love their basketball. They love their Celtics. And, and you know, we in, do. In my life, in my, you know, my life really sort of uh, mirrors the spirit of the Celtic nation, which was when I right. first got started – and I fell in love with Bill Russell and the Boston Celtics early on because of the way that Chick Hearn, a Laker broadcaster, would describe how great the Celtics were and how magnificent and, and, and just dominating and, and, and just omnipresence of, of Bill Russell in everything in the world. I found hope, I found opportunity, and I found purpose. And then over the course of my life, I added 
to that pride, loyalty, and gratitude. And when you think of all the elements of the community of the Celtic nation in New England and, and throughout the universe, really, I mean, it's the same thing. Hope. We're going to win. Here we go, Celtics. Opportunity. We've got a chance. Let's get going. Purpose. What are we going to do? And why are we doing this? And let's get started. And then pride, the satisfaction with our choices. We had Red Auerbeck and nobody else did. And then loyalty. No. Do we care? Does this matter to us? And yes, the Celtic nation, it matters. And then the gratitude, the respect, the admiration the appreciation for everything, everything that goes into it, the community, the team, the town, the, the restaurants, the neighborhoods, the airport, all the people who keep the city going, the politicians. Uh, I am truly the luckiest guy in the world. Bill, with two L's, you've got a name. I'm trying to bring my game. You've made a name, Bill, with two L's. What, what off the court experience? I'm going to just ask a little bit more about that year because I really want to know what off the court experiences really stick out to you as a team. You guys had a camaraderie like no other team I really have seen in history, except for maybe the 08 Celtics. We did everything together. It was a very close team, and there was a wide variety, diversity. Uh, of personalities, of age. It was a veteran team. The core guys were, you know, were veteran guys, but there were some young guys on the squad too. And, and there was uh, all kinds of, 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 of different personalities and, and guys who had different dreams. And, but at the end of the day, you know, yes, we had the chief who was the foundational pillar in the middle that allowed everybody else on the wings and the perimeter to go crazy. Uh, because he was always holding down the center, and you have to control the center. And uh, yeah. we, had, we had Dennis Johnson, who was a Hall of Fame player and uh, just a magnificent player. And there was a time in, the, in history when Dennis Johnson was the best player in basketball. And, and that's hard yeah, to do. Yeah, it was it. That is hard to do. And then he came and uh, you know, he went to Phoenix, and then he came to the Celtics, and he was just perfect. And Larry always raved about DJ as being the best player that he ever played with. And – then there was Danny Ainge, who was uh, staggering to me and disappointing that Danny is not already in the Basketball Hall of Fame. And he's That's in the astonishing, Hall of Fame. Bill. He's in the Hall of Fame of life, but he's a great yeah. basketball player who was a significant member of one of the historical teams in the history of the game. And then he has also gone on to a remarkably successful post-playing career as an executive, as a coach, as a television media commentator, did it all. And he's given his life yep. to make the NBA what it is, and he belongs in the Hall of Fame now. What are we waiting for? And then, I couldn't agree and then you, had, you had Scott Wedman coming off the bench, who was yeah. – who often was the second best player in the world. But he was playing behind Larry, and Larry wasn't coming out. And <laughs> – <laughs> whenever, whenever Casey Jones, our coach, you know, we loved Casey Jones. And we would do anything for the guy. He was the perfect coach for our team. And when, and when he would put somebody in, Scott or, 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 or Rick Carlisle or Jerry Seasting or me, for Larry, we'd go in there. We'd say, Larry, you're out. And Larry wouldn't leave the game. <laughs> and he'd yeah, just, you, know, you got to go in for somebody else because I'm hot and I'm not coming out right now. It's, I'm feeling great. And yeah, so uh, we, we'd look around and somebody else would say, okay, I'll go sit down for a little while. But uh, and, and, and Jerry Seeking was a magnificent contributor to the team and a, and, and a great uh, spirit and, and heart and soul, really, of the team. And then Rick Carlisle, who, who of all the guys, of all the guys, I think I'm proudest of Rick Carlisle because of what he has done with his life uh, against all odds. Because, you know, here, here was a guy who was, just, you know, who was at the end, the end of the rope. And, yeah. and, um, mm -hmm. and now he's the head coach of the Dallas Mavericks, is a premier franchise, always the voice of common sense and morality and dignity and class and professionalism. And he has been doing it forever. And who would have ever thought, you know, who, who started at the very bottom, couldn't get a job, and then... And then Bill Fitch said, uh, let's go. You're coming with me. And, uh, or it might have been Chuck Daly. I, I can't remember. You have to ask Rick Carlisle exactly what happened. But uh, one thing I'll, I do I'll, know I'll hunt exactly him down. was that on the, 
uh, after we were, after we won the championship after Game Six in uh, in Boston, and uh, I woke up the next day. I woke up with Rick Carlisle's shirt on. So I don't really remember how that happened, <laughs> but it. Uh, uh, Rick is a Rick is a great friend, a fabulous husband and father, and and just a community leader and a remarkably great basketball coach and a spectacular piano player. And I love it, the piano myself, but I can't play a lick. I just like to practice, practice and same here, practice. Bill. Yeah. How did he enjoy the Grateful Dead concert that you guys all went to at the Centrum? How did he enjoy it, or how did I enjoy it? I always have the time of my life. Oh, Bill. I can't speak for, for other people. I can speak about other people. But if you want to ask the, okay. uh, how it went for them, you have to ask them. But right uh, on. I've been a deadhead now for, I've been a deadhead for, let's see, 53 years, uh, uh, starting in 67. I was uh, 15 years old. It was the summer of love in California. And I, I remember when I, I first got to Boston, and it was the very first game we played in the garden. It was an exhibition. It was the early November. Uh, well, the concert, you know, they ultimately they went to a lot of concerts. Uh, <laughs> cool. We all went together. There's different kinds of concerts and lots of fun all around. But there, there was a, at, at the first Boston Celtic game that I played in as a Celtic, uh, it was an exhibition game in the garden. And it, it was in the fall and we were playing against Philly. And Philly had an excellent team, you know, Dr. J and Barkley and Moses Malone and a whole bunch of other guys. And yeah. so oh, yeah. the game is going on and the place, it's an exhibition game. Now, granted, I, I just came from six years with the Clippers and where yep. the games were played in front of family and friends. Now, all mm -hmm. of a sudden, we're playing in the Boston Garden, and the place is rocking, and the place is not a seat to be had for an exhibition game. And, and Larry is just going absolutely crazy, and the fans are yelling, 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 chanting his name. And MVP, MVP, and the scoreboard above the garden is just going up and down and rocking back and forth. And it's like, yeah, this is what I'm looking for. This is why I came here. And so I go up to Larry during a dead ball, and I said, Larry, the fans are chanting now. I've been in here, and it sounds like they're chanting, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. And, and, and he looked at me with this wise, wild, crazed look in his eyes, and he said, hey, I know you're new here, but they're chanting my name. And if you want to stay around here, you better learn to realize and recognize that they're chanting Larry, Larry, Larry. And I soon came to know why they were doing it. Because Larry Bird was the greatest player I ever played with by far. And he was, you know, there were other great ones. There were other great ones. But, but Larry was, he was a cut above. And, you know, he, he had it all. Larry Legend. Well, Bill, we have a few more minutes here. I have a couple more questions for sure. you. I uh, actually do have a question from one of my listeners. Are you riding, uh, bike, if, are you riding you bike for Humanity on Saturday or? Bill, two years ago, I broke my tibia and I have a, a, a metal plate oh. in my leg. And oh. actually, you know what, Bill? I want to talk to you about pain management and how you've overcome your, your pain. Well, I've lived my life in chron constant chronic pain in my adult life. I spent half my adult life, Bill, what's in the name. I spent half my adult life in the hospital. I spent all I the vast majority of my adult life in constant and chronic bone and joint pain. I was born with bad feet. I tore up my knee when I was 14, playing against some really old guys. They were in their 30s. I was torching them. They didn't like it. They <laughs> down. And then when I was 21, playing for UCLA, uh, I was low bridged, undercut, submarine in a game, and uh, took me down, flipped me over, and I ended up breaking my spine. And so here I just got this broken body that I lived with all the time. You, know, you, you find your way through it. It's like it's – like, what we're faced with with COVID-19, the economic crisis. We didn't even get to the other ones. We talked about the, uh, the, you know, we didn't talk about the climate change issue. We didn't talk about the species extinction. And we didn't talk about the social justice aspects of what's going on and the awakening that is long overdue and which I fully support. And because the, the level of inequality in our country, in our world is unacceptable and it's unsustainable. And so we're working feverishly on that. So as 
we talk about how we're going to get through this, we have to find that new path forward. And, and the critical aspect is getting out of the pain. And uh, once you're out of the pain, and, and, and for me, that required the doctors and surgery and medicine and all kinds of things. Uh, 38 orthopedic operations, that doesn't count all the skin operations. 38 now, Bill? When did you have yeah, the, those, are the bones. those are on the bones. And, oh, right on. And, and so, you know, I, I've had a ton more on, on the skin and the organs and all that kind of stuff. And so it, it but I'm doing great today. You know, I'm it, your true inspiration in all aspects of life, Bill. And I wish I could have got, I just have a couple more questions. Did you sure. get your bear dunks yet? Excuse me? Did you get your Nike SB uh, Grateful oh, Dead dunks yet? The Nike, the Nike Pro Low Dunks. No, yes. the, oh, the Nike Dunk Low Pro, sorry. I got the Nike name. SB Dunk uh, Grateful Dead. They're a skateboarding shoe. <laughs> no, I got it. And I'm a skateboarder. Right on. I, I was in the early days. And, uh, you know, how's your leg doing now? Man, I mean, it's a lot better. I was on the couch for six months after that accident. I still have the, uh, like, essentially a soccer shin pad inside my, my, uh, no. my leg holding it together. Uh, but, you know, Bill, I'm grateful for every day. I try to stay as positive as possible. So faith and patience, and, uh, don't give up, you can make it. But find a way to get out of the pain. And, and, and you can't really yeah. mask the pain. You have to get to the cause. And one of the things that we're I want to take up biking. biking. One of the things with Bike for Humanity is that we are mm -hmm. not looking at symptoms. We're looking at causes and trying to rectify those causes and, and change yeah. the reason why bad things happen. And so, right on. but the shoes, Nike, and the Grateful Dead, that is a, a harmonic convergence of the highest order. And it's just perfect because it's, when you think of those two great companies, you, talk, you, you, know, you always think about innovation, you think about creativity, imagination, authenticity, currency, and, and being real, being real with the fans. It, the, the spectacular right, fans right? that both of them have. And, and for it to all come together and all the different aspects, the artistic imagination and the different, the different creative designs that they have incorporating Owsley and Bear and all that the, and the dancing stuff and the logos and what Rhino has done and the, the you know, the Grateful Dead. Wow. What a group. What a team. Very much like what myself. A it's been a long, strange trip, Bill, for the both of us, and this is uh, solidifies it for me personally. I know you're busy today. I can't be more grateful to have to have spoken with you, and uh, I truly do it. With you, just uh, one more time, let my listeners know where to uh, find to sign up for Bike for Humanity. Yeah, Bike for Humanity. Go to go to our website, which has all this stuff, and it's free to sign up. It's free. It's free to sign up. It's free to participate. The only thing we ask is at the end of the day, after you do something and you're out there exercising, working on your health, you can learn all about it at our website, which is bikeforhumanity.com. Just spell it all out. There's no numbers. There's no capitalization specific stuff. Bikeforhumanity.com. It's all right there. I've got videos on there. I've got letters on there. I'm a volunteer. And so here, we're, we're just trying to make things better. And what you do is you can sign up free, participate free. And if you choose, look at the different organizations that we're supporting out there, Boys and Girls Club, Rex Foundation, No Kid Hungry, and Free Bikes for Kids. This is about empowering, enabling, and making other people happy and putting food in their stomachs putting wheels underneath them and putting creative ideas inside their hearts, minds, and souls. So please, won't you come with us, enjoy it. And when we ask what's in a name, I'm going to say Bill Lang. Wow. What an awesome dude. Not only does he got a name, he's got game. Bill, keep on trucking on. I wish you love and happiness and health and all the best, my man. And, Bill, uh, much love, eternal gratitude. Here we go. We're moving on. A new path forward. Keep, keep Hope and opportunity. Make different better and do what's never been done before. No problem. Let's get going. You can't finish what One you don't love. Start. Bike for humanity. Bike for humanity. Much love, Bill. Keep on trucking, my friend. All right. Take care, buddy. Thank you. Thank you again.